Welcome to the first meeting on the North American Microflora Project. Um, yeah. <laughs> not, not sure why it took so long. <laughs> but here we are. And I want to thank some people for this. Uh, one person who's been running around the room here is Bob Marak. Bob, could you wave your hand? Back there in the back. He's, he really made this happen physically in this, in this area. And Gene Lodge has worked with him and uh, got the catering lined up and everything. And so everything that works locally is, is due to them. Um, Karen Hughes got the Feeson website up and has kept it uh, almost up to date by the minute. If I'd sent her an update, it went on that same, that same day for sure. Um, David Rust and Elsa Valinga. And And the money, of course, uh, for the meeting came from the NSF Research Coordination Grant called FESIN. If you don't know what FESIN is, I'm not going to tell you now, but Google, <laughs> Google it later. And you will get to th this site, and you can click into it. This is actually the sixth meeting by FESIN, uh, and, and probably the last one. Uh, but, but it's been a good source of funding for meetings such as this. OK, the goals of this meeting are simple. We want to outline a white paper, and I think we're going to target this for bioscience. People ask me what a white paper is. I really have no idea, guys. It's like, <laughs> it's a paper that isn't yellowed yet, and it's, and it's uh, but what, is, what it really is, is, it, is we're going to lay out uh, what we want to do and why we want to do it in a convincing way. That's what a white paper is, yes? And so that's, that's our goal for this meeting. Uh, and also, we want to create a framework to progress toward a microflora it, that's kind of concurrent with the, with the white paper, but that's talking to ourselves, where the white paper is talking to others. So there are things probably that, that we will talk amongst ourselves on that won't go into the white paper, but are important for the organization. So we were talking about possible titles for this, and, and you know, I was emailing people around periodically about this, and, and I think the best suggestion I got was from Eric Lilliskoff. He suggested uh, North American microflora. You mean we don't have one of those? <laughs> Um, and this is probably one of these internal things that we won't <laughs> share, but I, but I thought this was amazingly accurate in a number of ways. The title I came up with um, was maybe a little more PC, and we can change this, of course, uh, but what I'm thinking of is something like working toward a North American microflora, an old-fashioned idea whose time has finally come. And, and the reason I like that is I think it is an extremely old-fashioned idea. I mean, floras have been around forever, but microfloras have not. We don't have a microflora for any region of the country, for any state in the country, and we certainly don't have one for the continent. Um, so it's a very old-fashioned idea, but I think, the, I think the planets are aligning so that we might actually be able to tackle it. So here's a rough outline for the paper. On your handout, you've got the same rough outline, but filled out in more detail. And my idea is that you could you could sit and make notes on this at some point, like, we need something here. And the, the uh, handout that you've got may be slightly different ordered from this, because as I was going through this talk, of course, I was changing order frequently, and, and print doesn't change as quickly. So, Raise your hand if you want one of these. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pick. <laughs> so the, the redded part of the text here, what, what is a microflora and why don't we have one of these things already? Eric's question, are sort of addressed in this website that, that uh, we put up with the help of David Rust and I basically slapped this thing up. There is not a lot in there yet, but there's connections to some previously published um, articles about this, including the, uh, the earliest one that I could find, which was the Metheny and uh, Valinga article in Inoculum, and then my more recent um, inoculum article on this and then a McIlvania one that addresses some of these basic points and we can probably pilfer some of the ideas from that. What I want to address now is, is what can it do for the scientific community? Not us per se, but, but others. And I think what uh, probably the, the best argument for what it does is it's, a, it's really a baseline for conservation. That unless we know uh, which, what fungi we have and where they are and which ones are rare, we can't even begin to talk about conservation of, of fungi. Obviously, we have started to talk about them. But, but I think in terms of credibility, we can't until, we, until we've got a good 
view of what we actually have. We'll get a biogeographic pattern of fungi for the continent, of macro fungi for the continent, which is something uh, that we have for things like animals and plants, but we don't have for fungi. And looking at these three major groups of eukaryotes together may reveal some, some interesting pattern that we don't have now. Um, it's going to give us a great sequence base for, for ecological studies. That's, that's my own pet uh, interest here, because I think a lot of the way that we see fungi now is not through their fruit bodies, but through their mycelium and, and through their DNA and the soil and, and plants and so on. And, and all of that is only as good as the names that they're connected with. And if they're not connected with well-identified vouchers, uh, that stuff is science fiction. Um, it, it'll give us enhanced identification tools for people that are not mycologists, as well as for those who are. And for us, I think it gives us a great recruitment tool to bring more people in, into the field because it's a very visible uh, project that, that I think people can, can get excited about. So what do we need to do to create a mycoflora? We need to assemble and, and scrutinize existing herbarium records and literature. And you're going to hear a talk by Barbara uh, Tears later today about a, um, an ongoing project that has NSF funding to do exactly this. We need more sampling. And this afternoon, uh, the first set of talks you're going to hear are about um, different regional sampling projects and how we've incorporated um, general public and, and existing records and so on uh, to start, start to figure out what's going on in particular areas. We need to recruit and train more people. I'll come back to that. We need new sequence acquisition and analysis. We need to create modern monographs. We have really almost none. Uh, and this will probably be the majority of, of, the, uh, work, of the less fun work, I would say. Um, and, we, and I think we need to set some realistic short-term goals and, and also set a structure so that we're moving toward the longer-term goal. And obviously, we need to find funding. So. Um, Going back to the recruiting and training more people, again, I was emailing people around when I was inviting them and so on and getting uh, input. And this, this was a recurrent theme that, that I got from people. Uh, I got this email from Tim Brony. He says, the issue I foresee is gathering a critical mass of workers to produce such a product. North America is a big piece of real estate with a significant number of taxa yet to be described in most groups of fungi. I think we all know this to be true. Um, and so, you know, just getting the, the people to do it is part of the problem. Karen Nakasoni emailed me back with, with a, a very similar sentiment. She says, speaking about the microflora, she says, this is something I'm interested in, but never imagined uh, that it could be done. Too many species and not enough taxonomists. So if you, if you look around this room, uh, you know, we've got a good cross-section of, of people that would be doing this project here, and it's a good mix of people that are professionally trained and people that have trained themselves to a high standard. And what, what we need to do is, is increase that pool, really, to make this happen. That everybody in this room, if we're not engaged with it, it's definitely not going to happen. Uh, and, we and we have to get more as well. So how big is this problem? Um, the, we don't really have particularly great estimates for how many uh, macro fungi we have, but, th but this uh, recent paper that came out in 2007 by uh, Greg Mueller et al., and some of the et al.s are in the audience here, um, was based on current names. It came up with a, an estimate of 10,000 species for North America, 65% of which were unique. Uh, in their conclusions, they, they realized this was not a great estimate. It says, using a list of names to estimate species is not ideal. Uh, however, the data sets for each region are often woefully incomplete, and most taxonomic groups have not been recently monographed, so numerous cryptic species will be uncovered. I think you're gonna, this will be a recurring theme in the afternoon talk, is that a lot of what we think we have are really one species, and then we find out that, no, it's like three or four. Um, so 10,000 is a, is a rough estimate, and, and probably it's, it's larger than that. Why do we need sequences? I know some, some people, I don't, this, this will be preaching to the converted, and, and they'll say, well, of course we need sequences. And other people go, come on, it just slows everything down. So, so I think 
the main reason we need it is that it really, it's, it's the unit of comparison across regions. That, and actually within region even, as you'll, you'll see, that many times we pick up what we think is the same thing and really what separates it is sequence. That everything that we look at on the first pass, and this is particularly true of the really obvious, easily identified things, uh, uh, you know, we, we group them all together and go, okay, this is one deal, and then you sequence it and find out, no, it's like three different ones. And the only way we're going to get that, of course, is with the sequence. It's going to allow us to connect to the, to the correct names via types, and I think there's been a lot of progress toward, toward getting sequences out of some old types, and I think um, Brandon's going to talk about this a, a bit this afternoon in his talk. And it allows us to connect again to environmental sequences uh, to organisms, and that's a two-way street. You can learn a lot about the organisms from the environmental sequence if you know uh, what that sequence is connected to. I want to give you one example of that. This is, this is a um, Sewillus that um, I'm familiar with, and uh, most people are not because it only fruits down at the bottom there in the, off the islands in, in uh, uh, Santa Cruz Island and Santa Rosa Island. That's where all the fruit body records are, but the yellow dots are all environmental sequences that come out of, of root tips. And this is not an atypical example. I think there's actually a lot of these kinds of things where, where when you start looking in GenBank for where the thing is, you find out, okay, it's all over the place, and we just didn't know it. Um, and so to be able to do that, we need sequence. How much sequence do we need? If uh, you go with that 10,000 species and figured that you'd want at least 10, 10 accessions of each to get some handle on whether you need more, um, you're talking about 100,000 sequences. Um, obviously, if we're doing the sequencing, we, we, don't want it, uh, we want it to be available to everybody who's collecting. So we, we've got to have some kind of system that allows us everyone access. That's probably a, some kind of centralized sequencing facility to do that. One that pops right to mind, of course, is the Barcode of Life Consortium. This is the kind of thing they do. Right, they have big rooms of sequencers and, they, and 100,000 sequences to them. It's a doable project, no problem. They've, they've done this kind of thing for like a lot of insect collections and everything. And I talked with Paul Haber at a different meeting this uh, winter and, and told him about this uh, microflora project. He was like, yeah, 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 it's a perfect barcoding project, let's do it. And in the meantime, the other piece of the planetary alignment that has happened is that uh, there's, there's uh, been acceptance of a of a barcode in the fungi, acceptance of a barcode that we've actually been using for two decades. But finally, uh, it has been accepted, uh, even by Siebel, I think. But when I emailed Paul back, this is what he said. Uh, basically, we're out of money and we're not doing fungi. So, uh, so I think uh, that actually they're quite, they're quite supportive of it in every way except financially. <laughs> So if, if, we find the money, if we find the money to do this, we, pr we probably will be able to uh, you know, talk them into being our centralized sequencing facility. And if not, then, then we'll have to take a step back and, and look at a different route. Creating modern monographs. What do we need to do for that? What, what do we want in a monograph? Obviously, we want a comprehensive, accurate, uh, current information. I think for all that, you want it easily edited. You want, uh, you want it specimen and sequence based so that you're, oh, is this, oh, it's off the line here. People can read that, can't they? Yeah. <laughs> you miss the little check marks. Um, you want it sequence and specimen based uh, with lots of cross links to metadata so that, so that you know what the evidence is for a species being in a particular place. You can go right back and pull up all the evidence for it. You want great keys with lots of illustrations. You want lots of color images. You want it portable, and you want it cheap. <laughs> That's the short list. So how do we do that? Let's look at an, let's look at an old example for comparison of, of what you know, monographs used to be. And I think really there's only one example of a monograph for macrofungi that purports to cover the con continent and actually did a reasonable job of it. And that's the North American polypores, which was published in 86, so it's almost a 30-year-old monograph now. When it first came out, uh, it was two volumes, first and the only time it came out, uh, it was two volumes. It cost about $200 in the mid-80s, so it was not cheap. And it, 
it was about 860 pages or something like that. So this would be about 5% uh, of the mycoflora. So multiply 800 pages times 20, and that's the format that if we had just this kind of information and blew it up to the whole mycoflora, that's what you're talking about if it was a published volume. If we, if we blow up uh, one of these descriptions here, or one of these uh, line drawings, you can see that the line drawing itself is, is uh, referenced back to a particular um, collection. So you can see where it came from. Um, and like most monographs that are 30 years old, this name is no longer any good. Um, and that's one of the problems, of course, with printed monographs. Almost as soon as it's out, there's things that have changed. Uh, you know, you're, you want to call it back from the printer. Wait. <laughs> um, and, if you, and if we look at the, uh, the map there, you can see, okay, we've got a continental scale distribution, and those dots were based on herbarium records, but there's no transparent way to go back to them on this. Uh, and you can see that, that the resolution here is pretty low. It's a dot per, per uh, state. So we don't really know what kind of habitat in the state it was, or where in the state, or maybe it's all over the state, or maybe it's just one spot. We don't know that. Um, and, and also, the distribution is a little suspect. It tends to be clustered around places like Louisiana, where you have uh, where uh, Meredith and, and Gill did a lot of collecting, uh, or around Gill's home, home state. And so you can, you can see pattern in there that's probably not real. And, you, and there's gaps that look very suspicious, where there's contiguous habitat, and we don't know whether this thing is there or not. Well, enter the modern age here. This is, this is a, a, sh a screenshot from Mycoportal, which is this thing that uh, Scott Bates has been putting together that, that grabs the herbarium records. He's got, uh, I think, just eight, eight herbaria now that are included in this. And so this is that species. And you can see, OK, we got one dot there so far from these eight herbaria. Um, but in this case, you can blow that up and see exactly where that record was. And you can blow that up and find exactly what that record was. So that's where we're heading, right? We're going to have this kind of data for all this stuff after the herbarium records gets sucked in. And if we set it up so that all the new records go into that, we'll then be able to maybe click on this and pull up a, a picture of what it looks like. So this is a picture of that species, a, a scenario myces from a Mushroom Observer. And Mushroom Observer is loaded with beautiful pictures, and some not so beautiful, um, uh, and lots of junk, um, and, and lots of good data. Um, and so I think uh, one of the goals will be to connect this in such, a, in such a way that we can make use of the best parts of this. And, and get all of this stuff uh, in sync together. If we go to, um, to the uh, keys for uh, polypores in North America, those of you who use them know that they were, I'll be generous here and say difficult. <laughs> uh, they're quite technical. Um, and they were not illustrated. So you can go, you can go online, though, uh, and pick up smaller keys to, to groups that are not as uh, comprehensive is that, and they're well illustrated with, uh, with beautiful pictures and, and very convenient links so that you can go uh, one couplet to the next and backtrack and so on. That's the advantage to a computer version of it. Similarly, uh, there, were, there were synoptic keys in the polypores in North America. These were impossible. <laughs> I won't be generous there. But they, were, they, but they were cool in that you have all the characters across the top and you have all the, you, off the screen there, we had all the, all the uh, uh, generic names. And so you could, you could see what the characters were aligned right away and just read across and go, OK, this is what's going on. But, but actually getting to an identification on those was almost impossible. Um, so enter, enter uh, discoverlife.org that you're going to hear about from uh, John Pickering shortly, where, where these kinds of uh, random access keys are, are what it's about. He's got it for all the different groups, including we've got some fungal keys. And so if you go to the fungal keys, what you find is all of those were made by Andy Miller. Um, and this is an example of one of those where there's little pictures that actually look better on my screen than they look here uh, to all the characters. So it's a very image-rich way to, to do this synoptic key thing. And you can just go through and with click boxes and pull up 
you know, what's left after you've eliminated things that don't have that. And it's very quick to get through and uh, uh, extremely convenient. So if we go back to this list here, I think the one that, that I want to add on to this, boy, this is really irritating that you can't read the, the, the far side, but. It's on full screen. It's on full screen. It's, it's just not jive somehow. We'll, all right, we're not going there. All right, we'll, we'll live with the irritation for now. Maybe on the later ones we'll get this. It needs to be electronic. And you can see the advantages here to electronic. Huh? <laughs> all right, so can we connect existing web resources together to provide the platform we need. Well, we've just seen a bunch of these, right? So there's the herbarium databases that are coming along. There's Michael Porthole. Th this is going to be the main repository for the specimen data and for the uh, uh, analytical tools for geographic information retrieval. I think that's pretty clear. Mushroom Observer would be a great place for the primary entry of images, especially, and, and data for these collections. And if it was made so that, so that it was more seamless, that you could go when you entered it in, the, the locations and stuff were in the right format to go right into a herbarium database, then it doesn't get retyped, right? Somebody enters it once, it goes into the database, it's, it's basically label quality data to, to print out. Discoverlife.org would be a great place, I think, for, for the primary keys for this. Wikipedia or EOL might be the place that we'd put uh, species pages, so instead of having two printed pages of stuff, we have an, a page that can always be updated and edited. And we, we probably have to figure out how we want to restrict the editing on that so that you know, when we get something we're happy with, it's, it's not constantly being moved back and forth. But I think that, that open editing is, is a plus as well as a minus. And obviously, we've got GenBank to put sequences. But here, uh, the database needs to be, we need to be able to annotate it. Uh, and we need these, the cross-links to specimens more automated, I think, than it is now. So, so a lot of the pieces are there. Let's return to this list and talk about funding. And I'll start this with an email from, uh, from Tim as well. Tim said, money to do this would serve, would serve as an important factor to bring morphological taxonomists into the group. We basically have been pushed off North America tropical regions in the past two decades to obtain funding to work. And he goes on about how this is not all bad. And certainly a lot has been accomplished by folks like Tim who have been out uh, in the tropics. But you know, look around the room, guys. This, this is true. You know, a, lot of our, a lot of our taxonomists don't get funded in North America. They have to go and, and do tropical work to get funding. We've got we've to convince people that there's an unfinished job here in North America where we need those people. That's, that's our job here today, I think, is to start working on that convincing argument. So what would, what would funding do? It's going to pay salaries, obviously. It's going to pay for travel. It's going to pay for curation, web construction, upkeep, sequencing. And I think part of it is that if we get some grant money out there, too, it, it means that you know, young assistant professors and so on have a, that want to do taxonomy have a chance to actually get funded and advance as a result of that. Because these days, advancement and funding are so tightly coupled that uh, anybody who doesn't get funding doesn't keep a job. And you know, the Michael Flora doesn't stop at the at the U.S. borders. Obviously, we need funding that that transcends the political borders here and moves into Canada and and hopefully Mexico eventually too. So, how much money do we need? Well, a rough estimate. I would say is that we'd want probably some regional centers, and each of those would have s staff associated with it that would help coordinate the, the curation of, of new specimens and the, and the logistics of that area. Uh, probably postdoc, student support, uh, travel, sequencing, all that going on. I would say probably around 300K per year per center times six centers is, is probably about eight, thank you. 18 uh, million per year times 10 years, which I think is sort of a minimum estimate for this. We're talking about $18 million, very, I think, very conservatively. So it's a, it's a big chunk of change, at least from my perspective, but maybe from others, it's nothing, right? What's 18 million? 
<laughs> All right, so, so how do we find this kind of money? And I think this comes back to the white paper. It's our job to convince others that, that it's worth that, 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 we've got, that we've got a project here that's worth that kind of funding. And the others we might want to convince, obviously, are, are people like NSF and foundations. The foundations have a lot of money. Uh, and I won't go there. <laughs> and maybe individuals, if anybody wants to get out their checkbook <laughs> or their uh, Cayman Island account number. Um, and, and I think for smaller pieces of money, you know, there's ways to, to couple this with existing grants that really have nothing to do with it. That's kind of what I've done over the time. I've never been funded for this, but, we, but we've kind of bubblegum together money by saying, okay, this is an REU associated with this mycorrhizal grant. This is a, uh, you know, the, this is a, a, a public, which I think is totally valid. That we, we've, got, we've got sort of the quintessential citizen science outreach project here that ought to be able to be an umbrella for almost anybody's NSF grant. Okay, so without funding, what can we do? Well, we can start to put the pieces together uh, for those, we, we can start to work on the pieces for which we have money, and we can coordinate those pieces so that, so that they fit together. So, you know, I'm, I'm painting a kind of a bleak picture of, of all the work we have to do, and I don't think we have much going yeah, but you know, if we just start to take the pieces and put them together, and we know where we're going, and we've got the basic structure that we're after, I, I think it'll self-assemble. <laughs> and, and it won't look smooth <laughs> initially, but eventually it, but eventually it can. It, it, you know, as long as we have the ability to edit and to uh, Im continually improve on what, what we've got, it'll get better and better. And I think we just have to live with it being less than ideal initially, but we've got to have this picture of where we're going and, and, the, and what we need to get there. So what we're doing today is we're looking at the pieces first. And in the morning, we're going to have pieces that deal with the electronic end. We're going to talk about uh, um, Mushroom Observer and then, and then uh, uh, Wikipedia and sort of how you uh, edit web content as a group and keep the quality high. We're going to talk about the discoverlife.org uh, that I mentioned briefly. We'll talk about the um, herbaria, uh, assembling the existing data for herbaria, and we'll, we'll get to hear about one success story of a, of a large mycoflora project from Europe. And this is in front of you, too, if you can't read these clipped off things. Um, and then this afternoon, we'll have examples of surveys. We'll have uh, examples of modern monographs and, and of large-scale barcoding sequencing. And then we'll have some fun tonight. And tomorrow you get the morning off. You can go, and this is because so many of you wanted to go to the 4A. Uh, but afternoon, 2 o'clock, we're going to start again. And at that point, it, it gets opened up to all of you to interact with each other. There's four main topics that we've split up here. They're spelled out more in this handout. Uh, in terms of what questions they're going to deal with. And after, after some time when people have interacted in the small groups, we'll come back and get a representative from each group to give us a quick summary, and we'll have a final discussion. And then, uh, and then the work will probably really begin with those people who want to help write this, this uh, white paper. And, and we'll lay out assignments on that. Okay, so thanks for coming. Thanks for listening. <laughs>